Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Greetings. Welcome to the ninth lecture uh, of Images, Imaginations and Cultures. This lecture is titled Images and Intersectionality. So, what I will do in this lecture is um, give a very broad overview of the idea of intersectionality as a sociological framework and then towards the end of the lecture. Um, I will show you some examples of, um, of images um, that relate to ideas of intersectionality and how we can go about analyzing them. So, uh, to start with the idea of intersectionality primarily comes from um, the body of knowledge produced by gender studies. And then um, intersectionality. I, I will I will show you you know the journey from gender studies to the to to intersectionality studies. But in order to achieve that, let's first uh, look at um, when we talk of identity. Uh, you know throughout uh, this this course, throughout many of the lectures in this series, um, you know I have been talking about the image, uh, the spectator, and creation of the spectatorship. So, I have been talking about uh, you know the power dynamics, um, you know the cultural uh, patterns, the social institutions they are embedded in um, and, and that idea of you know giving rise to a viewership, that idea of giving rise to spectatorship um, you know speaks directly or indirectly with many of the intersectionality identities intersections at various points. So, when I say uh, you know uh, the intersectionalities um, of identities, um, I mean these broad variables that you see on the screen that inform a person's or a group's um, you know social dynamic attributes. Starting with uh, the biological idea, which is mostly anatomical, gender, uh, the idea of age, race, ethnicity nationality, religion, education, marital status, etc. So, each of these attributes would go a long way to inform a person's identity and um, as you can well imagine, um, you know would inform the way in which the viewer um, you know would be viewing a particular image. So, it is all the more important for us to acknowledge um, these nuances uh, and you know in order to understand the idea of uh, spectatorship. So, um, if you look at the evolution of identifications of human identifications in human society and you know from where the idea of social stratification is also um, you know um, giving rise to. So, the diagram that you are uh, seeing on this screen on the left hand side you see um, you know um, the shift from modernism to a shift from postmodernism on the right hand side. Um, and if you look at the components um, you know um, defining modernism, defining the moment of modernism, you do see that you know a very strong characteristic feature was um, you know just the monolithic understanding of being human that you know human beings as a monolithic uh, uh, you know sort of a homogeneous sort of an identity um, was very strong towards uh, you know in the in the uh, you know tenets of modernism which we find a uh, sort of um, you know this monolith becoming uh, sort of weakening um, as we go towards transitioning from modernism to postmodernism. And so, we do see that um, at the transition moment of uh, you know from modernism to postmodernism, we do see that you know there is this acknowledgement of differences first in the form of singular difference that either or sort of a difference. 
and then um, you know in the form of multiple forms of differences and then um, we do see the questions of power dynamic relational power dynamic coming in the question and finally if, if you move towards the right hand side of the diagram uh, towards the you know stronger side of postmodernism we do see the questions of fluidity and instability taking over um, you know from the monolithic uh, idea of being human being um, and so if you look at the you know the transition moment if you look at the differences part um, you know from singular to multiple to relational power difference you know a lot of it actually um, has been informing how the intersectionality paradigm how the intersectionality framework has been growing and um, has been evolving so uh, for example if you are familiar with the history of gender studies um, you would know that um, you know what it meant to be human uh, you know started uh, started in the form of also giving way to the idea of singular differences in the form of binaries male or female right um, which in in turn also gave way to the idea of multiple forms of differences that um, you know it's not a binary but there are multiple forms of dif dif differences that inform gender relations and finally um, and you know at the crux of the very fundamental um, premise of intersection Intersectionality is the idea of power dynamics. So, this evolution of identification, this diagram becomes all the more important for us to um, acknowledge at this point as we move ahead to talk about, uh, you know, how many of these social differences that we see, um, you know, around us give rise to social stratifications. So, social stratification is something again um, we have been talking about uh, in, in this lecture series um, and I have been talking about this embeddedness um, of images in um, social structures in you know various social uh, stratas and I have also been talking about uh, you know the idea of viewership the idea of spectators you know viewers coming from various social positions um, and that informing the way they would um, you know look at an image or imagine or interpret an image so let's take a quick look at what we understand to be social stratification um, and how we understand social stratification in the context of um, image so, when we talk of social stratification using a sociological lens, um, we do acknowledge that it is a trait of any given society. You would hardly find in a society, um, you know, where you would not find social stratification. And, um, but at the same time, it is not simply a reflection of individual differences. It is not, um, you know, uh, that um, social stratification is looking at how person A is different from person B. No, that is not social stratification. What it is looking at is as a trait of the society, how groups are arranged in particular strata um, given a particular variable and some of these variables I have just shown you in the opening slide. Um, and because uh, you know this is an arrangement within society that we see because of the um, you know existence of social um, variables, um, social stratification is a social construct. It persists over generations that it is not that you know we will not see social stratifications vanish um, you know after um, uh, some generations. Um, the idea is universal so it is going to exist uh, you know as long as human society would exist um, but the nature of uh, you know social stratification varies across uh, different societies. So, so you know the, the idea of stratification is uh, cultural universal you know the idea of cultural universal we talked about in the first lecture. But the form the nature of social stratification uh, across societies would be different. And very importantly uh, for our purposes here um, for studying of images is that um, social stratification involves not just inequality. So, we are not just talking about inequality um, you know across the strata, but we are talking about beliefs. We are talking about belief systems as well um, in this stratification. So, um, you know so now if you take this composite if you take this as a whole of understanding social stratification and put it 
um, in the context of a social location of a spectatorship or the social location of an image, how an image is produced or um, you know what are the power, power geometries guiding uh, behind the production of an image. Um, probably it would be more meaningful for us to uh, you know understand that analytical lens better. So social stratification, um, uh, you know, is formed by these various um, intersectionalities of identities, and these are some of the classic, um, you know, intersectionality variables um, that uh, you know a sociological lens would look at. Um, for example, race, ethnicity, social class, caste, gender, and uh, sexuality. So, for uh, the sake of time and for the purposes of this lecture, I am just going to look at um, the question of race in this um, lecture, the question of gender and sexuality because we are talking about um, intersectionality and some questions of uh, you know social class uh, towards the end of this lecture. But this is not to say that ethnicity and caste um, are not important in this uh, conversation. They are of extreme importance and there has been you know many significant uh, studies uh, particularly on caste uh, um, that look at uh, you know caste as a variable in understanding images um, and so does scholarship look at on ethnicity. So I will for, for the purposes of this lecture I am just going to look at race um, and the ideas of um, gender sexuality in the context of intersectionality. So, um, why do we need to look at gender? You know, what does gender give us with an added, you know, added vantage point that will help us to understand um, or examine images um, better? So, gender, if you are familiar with uh, the, the history of gender studies, you will see that gender emerged um, in the late 20th century. As, as, as a variable, as a variable that, um, that was um, sort of absent in social theorizing from 18th to the early 20th century. And before the advent of the idea of gender as an analytical category, what is to drive scholarship in that regard was the assumption of binary differences um, in, in that moment of theorizing. So, as I was saying, the binary difference of uh, male or female, you know, they would not be gender variables, but they were rather statistical variables um, to understand, um, you know, the biological condition of the body. Um, and over time and over the decades and centuries, we do see that these ideas um, have evolved into a more fluid concept of gender from the static idea of, um, uh, of uh, biological condition of the body. And so, gender over time has started to become, has become an analytical category um, in current scholarship. Um, and we do see that, um, you know, symbols, cultural symbols, uh, you know, play an important role um, in constitutive elements based on perceived differences. So, when we, um, you know, look at each other in society, uh, you know, we are constantly trying to categorize ourselves in the form of gender. And, um, you know, uh, while the process of categorizing seems to be static, um, you know, gender itself is not that static an idea. So, gender itself, you know, is more fluid than we understand it to be. And, um, you know, the way that we can bring in more fluidity in that idea is through, uh, you know, the, the practice of cultural symbols uh, that we attach to any of these categories. Gender as, a, as, a, as an analytical category, um, it al also signifies um, relationships of power. So, power is something that we have talked about, um, you know, throughout this lecture series and we have also seen um, the questions of power geometries as proposed by um, Doreen Massey, um, power as, um, you know, proposed in gender geographies of power framework. Um, Power as proposed um, by Foucault um, um, in, in, in the idea of, re, you know, understanding relationship between the viewer and the viewed. So, um, gender signifies power relationship and, 
you know, it, it sort of creates a collective illusion constructing class and gender. And so the class, and here uh, class is social class, you know, also, you know, um, you know, the construction of social class images have a role to play in constructing, um, you know, such social classes. Um, for example, in one of the lectures, I use the example of viewing of um, Mona Lisa, you know, in the Louvre Museum. And, um, you know, I was talking there about Foucault and the power dynamic that goes behind the scene in that, um, you know, effort to look at Mona Lisa's um, uh, the, the painting. Um, and so, you know, what is the purpose behind viewing of an image or what is the purpose behind um, you know, producing an image, right? So I'll talk about these dynamics a little more um, later in this lecture. And then gender as a subjective identity. So we have looked at, um, you know, throughout the course of uh, some of these lectures, um, creation of these subjects, right? Creation of um, the uncritical human um, looking at an image to translating, um, you know, into and um, you know a subjective uh, sort of a view, so creation of a subjective identity, and particularly in this respect, uh, looking at gender as a subjective identity, um, whether as part of an image, or um, you know whether that image is how that image is produced or created or viewed, um, we do have um, you know scholars particularly using a post-colonial lens and not really talking about images per se, but um, most of their work actually relate to, um, you know, significant aspects of image, not in the form of, um, I would say, uh, tangible, but in the form of ideas and ideological constructs of images. So, if you are familiar with the works of Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak, Mrinanali Sinha, I will, um, I will use uh, some of their work in this lecture. Um, Lata Mani's work, Partha Chatterjee's work, Deepesh Chakraborty, Rachna Majumdar, and Stoller's work on um, gender as subjective um, identity, particularly using the post-colonial lens. So having said that, when we look at uh, an image, when we look at an image and we try to understand um, sort of the gender orientation, sort of the intersectional orientation of that image, um, historically we see that, you know, as an analytical category, as, as a category of uh, historical analysis, um, gender is viewed uh, primarily in two different ways. One is gender as descriptive, that you are, uh, you know, just existing without any interpretation. And, um, you know, this, this form of gender as descriptive that you're just viewing um, in an uncritical manner is the idea of, uh, you know, the lack of uh, acknowledging any power dynamic that you are attaching between the viewer and the viewed. And uh, the other, uh, you know, level of critical inquiry that you can think of is gender as causal. And so how and why, you know, gender um, cannot be extrapolated from its cultural practices, cannot be extrapolated from its social settings is something that we need to inquire. And this resonates with, uh, you know, some of the critical frameworks that we have, um, you know, learned in this uh, series of lectures, uh, starting with GGP, starting with boundary work, and, you know, looking at more macro scale of Foucault's idea of power um, uh, and, uh, and, and Barthes and, and Derrida's idea of uh, deconstruction. So, uh, so to understand gender, um, you know, within a given image context, um, you know, if we adopt a more causal sort of an analytical lens, um, that will give us a more um, critical sort of an, um, you know, interpretation of that image. Another theorist in this regard, uh, you know, that uh, we find, um, you know, helpful, 
to understand visual culture, um, particularly in, in the uh, area of gender discourse. Um, and this is a theorist I have talked about in one of my other lectures in this series also. Um, but it is helpful to bring this voice again here to understand, um, you, know, you know, the gender dynamics getting into um, towards the intersectionality dynamics. So I'm talking about Stuart Hall, uh, the British um, you know, the, the school of thought of from British cultural studies. Um, so Hall again was a Jamaican born cultural theorist and he brings with him the idea of, uh, you know, discourse as a set of statements which provide a language for talking about. So here, um, what is interesting um, for us as um, scholars studying images and intersectionality is to focus on how, how Hall's ideas of the discourse, um, you know, put forward language as power relations. That, um, you know, when we talk of, when we, when we speak of language, um, we are not really talking about an image per se, but we are talking about language, we are painting or we are ideologically constructing an image um, that may be gendered. And I will show you an example um, of how that, uh, you know, has been done historically also. Um, so uh, just remember that in this case, uh, you know, the, the point of view that Hall is talking about, um, you know, the role of language as power relations goes a long way to actually, um, you know, inform how images can be seen, um, you know, in, in terms of their intersectionalities also. So just to revise what Hall has been saying about, um, because we draw a lot of inspiration about images um, from media sources, from advertisements, um, and Hall is, um, you know, giving us this, uh, you know, sort of model of encoding and decoding, uh, you know, what we watch, what we experience, and you know how those encoding and decoding are embedded, uh, you know, in deep social structures embedded within the frameworks of knowledge um, that we are part of. So what, uh, you know, Hall is talking about is the process of encoding, a process of, um, you know, attaching um, symbolic boundaries, attaching symbolic meanings, um, you know, giving rise to me meaningful discourse and then decoding, then um, actually interpreting them um, to inform pro possibly new forms of um, frameworks of knowledge. So Hall's idea is resonating here with the idea of representation also. We have um, uh, seen a part of uh, this when we talked about semiotics um, in, in, in um, lecture 3, um, that the semiotics um, of uh, culture, the, uh, the structural and scientific study of science and symbols um, has focused by and large on the question of representation and on the sign as symbolic and by and large it has been highly critical of approaches that recognize the relative degree of motivation between signs and objects. So, you know, the symbolic meanings that we attach to objects as images, the symbolic, uh, you know, meanings that we attach to these boundaries become, you know, all the more important in this context. So, coming back, so looking at Hall and, and questions of representation and coming back to the question of gender is that then, um, you know, gender in a way in this case, um, you know, provides a way to decode, not encode meanings and, and to understand the complex connections among various forms of human interaction. That we are talking about decoding, uh, you know, and I'm talking in the context of images, um, that we are talking about decoding, um, you know, practices, decoding, um, you know, symbolic uh, values, uh, decoding interpretations um, related to gender. Um, and you know that 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 decoding is actually driven by complex connections uh, in in various forms of human interaction. So um, one way to look at this idea of decoding 
and um, you know rendering gender a more fluid sort of an idea um, we you can uh, look up Judith Butler's work uh, where she talks of, of gender as performativity um, so she Butler's theorization about gender um, introduces the notion of performativity the idea that gender is involuntarily performed within the dominant discourses of hetero reality. So this is where Butler, Butler is, uh, you know, forming the theory of performativity is that, um, you know, we are constantly negotiating our gender dynamics um, as part of an identity. And, um, you know, that uh, forms the fundamental principle behind performativity. And what when we perform gender when we when the actions activities of performativity takes place it is taking place within a you know deep seated social um, structure deep seated dominant discourse of hetero reality that um, you know um, heterosexuality or hetero normativity is the hetero reality so um, and, and Butler uh, talks about performativity as the reiterative power of discourse to produce the, uh, the phenomena that it regulates and constraints. So, so you can, and, and uh, she has a very short uh, uh, sort of a interview on YouTube. Um, its title is Judith Butler, Your Behavior Creates Your Gender. So you can take a look at it um, if you wish. Um, but, um, you know, this is pulling in together gender, the idea of gender as being fluid, um, a, a, an idea and, you know, the uh, practices of decoding ideas of gender, um, you know, through um, viewership, through spectatorship, through an image um, and, um, you know, in, and, and negotiating certain power dynamics in that regard. So going on, uh, moving on with the idea of um, fluidity um, of gender, and this is important because again, in the end, uh, you know, as you will see, um, you know, gender uh, as part of an intersectionality variable has played a very important role um, in defining many of the images, objects, um, ideological practices as images. Um, that we see around us, that we have seen around us historically and contemporary also. So, um, just to, uh, uh, you know, build on that foundation that gender, uh, you know, the evolution of gender studies, um, you know, have, have looked at that it has not been um, just women's stories or not just men's stories, but how people relate to each other in society. Um, and, and that is often a power relationship. So we do see that, um, you, know, uh, you know, branches of gender studies, um, you know, critical theories of gender look at, uh, you know, aspects of feminisms, aspects of masculinity, um, aspects of L LGBTQI uh, studies. So we do see that sort of a, you know, evolution in fluidity in the understanding of um, um, gender um, over time and through space. Um, and at this point, uh, moving on to question of intersectionality, um, you know, we find that much of this scholarship acknowledged that, um, you know, gender um, is not really operating in vacuum. Uh, but at the intersection with various axes of differences. So these various axes of differences is something that uh, I talked in my opening slide, um, you know, starting with age, your biological condition of the body, um, race, ethnicity, nationality, religion, education, marital status, um, etc. So gender operates along and across, uh, you know, these variables to give us uh, the intersectional social position of people. And, and that is important because, um, you know, the social location of the viewer, um, the social location of spectatorship, you know, influences the interpretation of the image. So coming to the point of intersectionality that we see that's around the 1990s, um, you know, when we see that gender has traveled, uh, you know, its journey um, to acknowledge fluidity, to acknowledge multiple 
um, forms of uh, gender. Um, we do see the scholars are arguing that uh, gender is not a property of an individual, but an emergent feature of social situations. And so it, it involves question of power. So something that itself is guided by questions of power will, um, you know, inevitably be influencing a more complicated power relationship, um, you know, in the process of uh, viewership. And, um, you know, the axis of identities that inform gender relations, as I was talking about, um, you know, give birth to this framework um, of intersectionality studies put forward first by Crenshaw, Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, you can read up her work um, um, and then, you know, taken forward uh, by Patricia um, Hill Collins. Um, that uh, uh, you know, they they are talking about the uh, you know genders um, you know uh, operation across um, and along these variables of um, power. And so um, you know, power, age, social status, and ethnicity all structure how gender-related behaviors play out, and how they also vary in particular situations and historical periods. So what is important here is also to acknowledge um, the, the moments, the uh, role of time and space. So um, because these relations would change across time, across space, um, you know, therefore the idea of spectatorship, the, the nature of spectatorship would also be shifting um, given a particular image. So a particular image would be, um, you know, differently viewed in a particular social context or given a time and space context and would be, you know, sort of viewed very differently in another context. Um, so um, intersectionality, um, then becomes a framework for us um, to understand these power relations. Um, and, you know, s uh, scholars have tried to define what power is in this respect. Um, we have seen classic works by Foucault, um, you know, uh, operationalizing the questions of power. We have seen, um, you know, the questions of power, um, you know, in other um, of the lectures in the series. Um, but in this context, power um, has been operationalized by some scholars as the ability of telling someone else a story and making it the only story. And this is coming from, um, um, you know, um, Chidamama Adichie's, uh, uh, you know, talk, The Danger of a Single Story, that, um, you know, the, the, uh, a single story, and that is how uh, she's arguing, um, is that the, you know uh, the if you look at a single story, you know you tend to create stereotypes, and you know that is in a way um, giving in a power dynamic that um, you know um, the power the danger of a single story is that it's not it's not a question of being good or bad, but it is um, you know incomplete, and so. Um, you know, in any storytelling, actually, where are you starting from? So, so all of these would, you know, play in the background, uh, you know, as, as uh, you know, you would understand spectatorship and, uh, and the image. So, um, gender, uh, in this case, becomes not a single story, but, um, you know, they are, um, you know, multiple, uh, you know, stories of fluidity and they do not operate in vacuum. So they always, uh, you know, operate in relation to other axes of power relations. So having said that, um, I do want to conclude um, this, uh, this part of intersectionality, this part of gender and intersectionality um, with a question of scale with a question of, uh, you know, broadening the aperture. Um, and uh, this is um, the idea of scaling intersectionality that, um, you know, earlier scholars um, when with the growth and uh, evolution of intersectionality paradigm framework, um, scholars have looked at, um, you know, the ideas of domestic intersectionality that is confined within a particular um, nation or a nation state or a country. 
And then um, it is important for us to actually expand um, the aperture, uh, broaden that aperture and look at you know, a larger scale, look at you know, across uh, multiple scales of local, regional, um, you know, transnational, national, etc. And this is um, a part of work that I've contributed to. Um, uh, and I welcome you to read this um, article of how um, my co-authors and I have actually operationalized, um, you know, the changing scales of intersectionality. So um, from here, now I will transition to talking a little bit about um, um, another component of intersectionality and, um, you know, race. And, um, you know, starting with the question of why race matters. So the question of, um, you know, race, uh, you know, has been dealt with, um, you know, throughout, you know, sociological uh, and anthropological literature and in, um, you know, in, in very, very, um, you know, significant ways. Um, so I'm just going to sum up that part for you very, very briefly and, um, you know, take you through uh, some of the images that will help us, uh, you know, uh, apply um, this concept of gender and race as intersectionality elements um, to understanding images. So um, race refers to an externally imposed system of social categorization and stratification. And uh, we do see that there is no true biological race that exists. Rather, um, human groups must be placed on a continuum. And typically, um, race refers to some set of physical characteristics granted importance by a society. So we see that uh, scholarship, uh, you know, acknowledges that uh, race is socially constructed. And this, uh, you know, a very large body of literature that actually um, looks at, argues, critiques um, the idea of race um, and, uh, you know, um, acknowledges that race is socially constructed. So I will not go into the details of that here. Um, um, you are welcome to take a look at that larger literature um, at your uh, leisure. Um, but what I will um, just um, just to you know um, carry on with this argument here is that you know when we look at these images um, you know, of racial classification of um, you know when we look at um, an image and we try to assign humans to discrete categories, right? Um, based on common ancestry, um, you know, we, we try to do a racial classification, um, you know, that itself, um, you know, can be a little misleading um, because, um, you know, human history does not give us a time when human beings and human groups have been neatly categorized um, you know, into groups and they have not moved and mingled. And so, um, the, the moment of human history, um, you know, tells us that human beings have always been mobile. And um, human populations have not been isolated enough from one another um, to develop into discrete groups of geographically isolated populations whose members can produce offspring that can live and reproduce. So the, uh, you know, driving home, uh, the fact is that when we look at an image, say of people or cultures or practices, and we try to assign um, sort of a racial understanding um, of that uh, to that image, um, you know, we need to think twice um, before we are actually looking at or interpreting, attaching any any form of signifier to that image. Um, I again um, urge you to look at this um, documentary by uh, the American Anthropological Association. It's there on YouTube um, and on their website also. Um, that uh, the title of the um, documentary is Race, Are We So Different? And in this, um, you know, they show how the category of race becomes um, socially constructed through history. And then what are, what have, what, what are the various, um, you know, social repercussions, of course, um, for that followed after that. Um, 
Here I will give you another example just to establish here um, you know how um, fluid the idea of race has been um, particularly in the European and American contexts. Um, and this is an example of the US um, census. If you look at the US census categories um, of, of race, um, you know, in the year of the first census in 1790, the race question looked very different, um, you know, than it does today. So, the categories on US census you see are free white males, free white females, all other free persons and slaves. And then in the next version of the census, you see that the categories have changed. And the categories now would read white, black, mulatto, and Indian. And then um, from there on, um, you know, in 1890s, um, you would see that, uh, um, you know, the categories have changed again, white, black, mulatto, quadroon, austroon, Indian, Chinese, Japanese. So, um, you know, summing up a very, very large body of literature on race and the social construction of race, um, you know, what we need for the purposes of this uh, moment, for the purposes of this uh, lecture is to acknowledge the fact that race is socially constructed. And so, when we look at um, an image that may have racial connotation according to the viewer, um, you know, um, we must first contextualize, um, you know, the geometry within which that image is situated. Because if you are, um, you know, looking at an image and, and as a viewer, you think that an image has racial connotation, then, you know, much of it, if not all of it, is a social construct. So, you know, that is the moment that we need to, you know, situate the viewer, situate the, um, you know, subject um, in the moment of social um, location to understand, um, you know, what you are viewing. Um, so, uh, the idea of an, uh, you know, race, um, and this is the book cover of actually Venus Neuer, um, that you can see the image um, of an African American uh, woman from the back. Um, you know, so these are very powerful images. Um, you know, that have gone, um, you know, influencing a lot of scholarly debates um, around race, around, uh, you know, the construction of the social construction of race and the ideas of cultural relativity that, you know, we need to bring in this idea that, uh, you know, each culture, you know, or images of each culture um, must be understood on its own term, not on the terms of the outsider. So, we have to socially contextualize, um, you know, each of these images that we are seeing and then, um, you know, uh, bringing into the interpretation and acknowledgement of placing the image in their social con uh, context. Um, this is a book that you may read uh, for, um, you know, for, for more knowledge um, on the uh, construction of race from Savage to Negro by Lee Baker. Um, but I'm going to now move on to uh, a more, um, you know, close, close at home um, uh, sort of an example in terms of image creation and, um, you know, using the post-colonial lens uh, and through the lens of, uh, you know, um, uh, um, you know, the intersectionality of gender and uh, race. And this is the moment of, uh, you know, that uh, the example I'm talking about is, uh, you know, the creation of manhood and the colonial empire. And this is coming from Rinalini Sinha's work um, on colonial masculinity, um, where Sinha actually draws um, the uh, audience to an argument that um, the the colonial empire building in South Asia, India, um, you know, were represented as a masculine enterprise. And um, the image that you see on the screen is the book cover of Sinha's book, which is titled Colonial Masculinity, 
the manly Englishman and the effeminate Bengali in the late 19th century. And mind you here, um, you know, Sinha is talking about manhood as a con as, as gender con context. And, you know, uh, she is she's drawing from discourse, she's drawing from colonial discourse that has this ideological construction of an image of an Englishman being quote unquote manly and an ideological construction of, um, of a Bengali man in this case to be quote unquote effeminate. So this is a classic example that we see, um, you know, drawing from Brilana Sinha's work that, um, you know, this gender discourse, um, you know, provides us with this ideological parameters to, uh, you know, navigate these power geometries of images. And of course, you know, there's this larger argument why this was required by the colonial um, rulers, you know, why these categories of, um, you know, uh, mask manly and effeminate, um, you know, manhood masculinities were required um, for the you know, running of the colonial empire. So, um, and this also speaks to the gendering of space through images that you see, um, you know, around you. And, and therefore, um, you know, again, um, you know, culturally contextualizing the image that you are looking at forms, um, you know, a very important part of, uh, you know, reading an image, of, of interpreting an image. So, um, coming back to the idea of, you know, um, the race concept and why is it problematic to just look at, um, you know, an image and assign a racial category um, or, uh, you know, any sort of, uh, you know, socially constructed category to that image is problematic is that um, scholarship has shown that, you know, human beings do not neatly fit into any um, one race. And so, um, you know, we have to be very, very careful um, when we look at an image and, you know, when we are looking at an image to interpret in terms of gender, interpret in, in, in terms of race, um, you know, um, the question we need to ask is, is there ample fluidity in our interpretation um, that we acknowledge um, and not, um, you know, um, not acritical about that viewership. So, um, this is another um, example of a set of, uh, you know, images that we see uh, again in the racial context and this is from um, the moment of apartheid and beyond, uh, you know, that, you know, each image in their own right, you know, tells us a lot about, um, you know, the, the social construction of race as we understand it and, um, you know, each image in their own right is carrying a symbolic meaning. So, again, I will not go deeper into this, um, but uh, this is just uh, used here, for example. Another example um, many of us, uh, you know, if not all of us are aware of um, is, you know, how these gender, um, you know, discourses, gender tropes are actually, um, you know, exercised, practiced in society through images, through the creation of um, images. And this is um, the example of the trope of the angry black woman and this is with regard to um, Serena Williams, um, you know, uh, sort of a moment in, um, in the game. And, um, you know, this is just to bring an example from very contemporary times to show that the ideas of uh, intersectionality, the ideas of race, gender, intersectionality are so ingrained into social structures that, you know, when we create images, whether um, again in the form of an object or a tangible painting or a photograph or a cartoon um, or an ideological construct of an image, um, you know, these these inform, uh, you know, the production of an image. And this is of utmost importance as scholars uh, uh, for us to acknowledge that we are always mindful of the critical angle, always mindful of the critical power play that is, you know, being negotiated in the process. So, um, moving on to 
you know what we understand to be this uh, you know intersectionality and intersectional standpoints you know I have talked about this before also so we are talking about an intersectional standpoint that is at the center at the intersecting points of these um, you know uh, um, experiences of race, class, gender, sexuality, nationality and that uh, you know all of these would intersect as at a position um, to produce a social location of power and that social location of power would be of you know utmost importance for us to uh, you know navigate the viewer viewed uh, power dynamic. And so context uh, you know matters a lot context matters um, in the form of um, you know whether you are you are looking at an object an image or um, whether you are looking at um, you know um, an ideological construct. So, summing up with uh, the idea of race and gender here um, you know um, scholar Oivumi actually sums it up uh, very nicely in this uh, regard is that the last five centuries described as the age of modernity have been defined by a number of historical processes including the Atlantic slave trade and attendant institutions of slavery and European colonization of Africa, Asia and Latin America. The idea of modernity evokes the development of capitalism and industrialization as well as the establishment of nation states and the growth of regional disparities in the world system. The period has witnessed a host of social and cultural transformations. Significantly gender and racial categories emerged during this epoch as two fundamental axes along which people were exploited and societies stratified. So, um, this is just summing up in a quote what I have been talking about uh, throughout this lecture that um, you know the two most important intersectional uh, variables race and gender have gone a long way to actually uh, you know inform uh, you know who we are as a people and um, you know who we are as a spectator. So, uh, from there now then uh, I come to um, the conclusion of uh, this lecture and I take you through um, you know uh, some very powerful images and we will try to uh, you know look at them uh, from the intersectionality point of view. Um, uh, the, fir the, the first picture that you see on the screen the black and white picture is uh, you know the photographer is unknown and it is a picture of a Chinese quotidian. And this photograph um, you know is showing um, you know an orientalist sort of a reclining female um, you know and in a studio setup um, uh, and you know uh, the photograph is taken in a studio setup moment. On the left of the screen you see um, you know the image of a newly married couple from um, from Asia. Um, uh, this is from Colonial Bengal, um, and this this is the cover of the book Marriage and Modernity: Family Values in Colonial Bengal by Rachana Majumdar. Um, and you do see a frame where you do see two people, uh, you know, uh, captured in that frame. Now. Um, you know bringing in the lens of intersectionality bringing in the questions of race and gender in this question um, is also bringing in the question of technological advancement. And in both the uh, uh, images that you see um, you know implicitly whether um, you know they are uh, there or not implicitly there is a celebration of technology happening and this is the celebration of technology in the form of the camera and the advent of studio photography. So, um, if you if you are familiar with the history of studio photography um, in, in um, particularly in Asia South Asia you will know that um, you know the idea that you can go uh, to a studio and take your photograph taken also speaks to power dynamics also speaks to questions of class construction. And um, you know this is something that intersectionality the framework will help you understand that um, 
you know, when you look at an image, try to also understand the setting of that image. And particularly, um, you know, given contexts like this, for example, um, in the next um, picture, um, we do see, and this is taken from um, the this is a, this is an, um, a CNN website, and here is the link. You can go and take a look at um, the other pictures also um, from colonial uh, India, and this is again a studio portrait that you are seeing, um, and and you know studio photography became popular among India's merchant classes and wealthy individuals. So in a way, um, this is speaking to class construction also. And, um, you know, uh, you know the, the very fact that you can go to a studio, you can afford going to a studio to take your photograph is also speaking to class construction. And so class, social class also becomes a variable of intersectionality in this respect. And um, finally, this is um, my closing picture for um, this uh, lecture is um, you're looking from uh, you know the same set of photographs from CNN um, website that you can go and take a look. Um, you know this um, you know the photo of Oriental races and tribes, residents and visitors of Bombay, and um, you know so the vantage point of the photographer, the vantage point of the viewer, um, you know even more becomes um, you know even more important in this context. So. Um, I do want to leave you with this question of intersectionality and, um, you know, particularly questions of race, gender, social class, um, caste as it would matter, um, you know, to understand images in their own rights, to understand images in their social locations. And that is when, um, you know, we would be able to capture the, uh, you know, the critical power geometries that not just the image is embedded in, but also the spectator. So with that, I would like to conclude this lecture. Thank you. Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. We usually know William Shakespeare as the most revered figure in the history of English literature. But we often tend to forget that he has also been one of the most hated figures in literature. And here I am not talking only about those boys and girls who have to memorize uh, long sections from Macbeth or King Lear or Julius Caesar uh, before they can go and sit for their school and, or college exams. But I am also talking about people who are themselves quite famous authors. Tolstoy, for instance, considered the writings of Shakespeare to be, and I quote, crude immoral, vulgar, and senseless. George Bernard Shaw absolutely loathed Shakespeare, as he did Homer. But perhaps no other criticism about Shakespeare is more damaging than the one which says that Shakespeare is a marvelous storyteller, provided someone has told him the story earlier. Now, this piece of criticism is particularly damaging because it is true. None of Shakespeare's plays contain any original story whatsoever. They are all written using pre-existing materials, pre-existing stories. Now, does that diminish the stature of Shakespeare as a dramatist? Well, I'll leave that for you to decide. See you in the next episode of Literary Snippets. <laughs>